All right, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tomasz Grodzki. I guess uh, I know some of you maybe from Golang Warsaw when I was an uh, active participant. And if I don't know you yet, I hope we will meet at some time, maybe in Golang Krakow, right? Or Golang Berlin or or anywhere in the in the, in the internet, maybe, uh, like now. Uh, so I've been programming in Go for about seven years now. And um, I come from C++ world, really, like before, before Golang. And what I'm mentioning is this is because when you are in C++, you are in a really deep ocean and you need <laughs> a quite wide knowledge of things beyond the strict just programming language to understand how things work, to be able to, um, to write a proper code. And the thread safety is one of it. And when you come from another languages, I don't know many of them, most of them, but for example, Python, uh, which I was also using before. When you're coming from Python, maybe thread safety is not something that you've been learning a lot because uh, maybe you are familiar with like a global interpreter log and something that basically takes care of um, of threat safety to some extent, and but because of that you are losing some um, uh, some features in the language. And basically, everything is slower. So anyway, what we are going to talk today is threat safety, and especially with using package sync. Um, so here is a, here is the outline. Just one question, guys. Can you see? Can you see my 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 my, my cursor? Maybe and that, like I'm just highlighting things or not? Yes, we can see. Okay, cool. So the outline of the of the talk is basically we, we are going to describe the problem. Then we are going to show some examples of good code and bad code, and uh, then we are going to see some solutions. In the end, I would like to do some live coding if possible. So what's the problem with threat safety? So this is basically a very simple overview of how, um, how, how your code work when using multiple CPUs, multiple threads and routines. So the routine, the Go routines are on the top and they basically they are Go routines and they are creating your application. But in order that the Golang is going to schedule those routines on the operating system threads, which basically you can have multiple of them. They are much more costly than Go routines and they are managed by, by the kernel. And one, one, Go, one OS thread can only run one Go routine at a given time. And then going deeper into the system, we have CPUs and a single thread can be only run on a single, uh, on Go, on a single CPU. Now, the problem comes when you have multiple CPUs, more than one, and then you're concurrently calling some code and both routines, let's say three and five, wants to write into a single memory block, right? The problem is indicated by the big explosion and explosions are bad. So definitely here is the problem. We are writing at the same time to a single block, but, when we are, this is not only the problem with the memory, really, when we are talking about concurrency and, and, and threat safety, um, we want to be able to use some shared resources. And the shared resources are bytes in memory, but not only. They can also be like the whole data structure. Uh, you basically data by data structure, I mean like a multi, like, like the whole like the whole structure. So multiple multiple variables in multiple uh, memory locations, but as a whole, they consist of like a, of a single structure, and the structure might be consistent. And this is one resource that we need to protect from multiple multiple um, uh, multiple uh, routines writing to it. So even even if one routine would be writing to it one memory block and the other to completely distinct memory block if those memory blocks are part of one resource that needs to be consistent we still can have a problem another resource could be like a network connection uh, so 
Sometimes we need to serialize writing to a single connection. So we have multiple routines writing to single connection. We want to make sure uh, that what we are sending is, is basically what is expected, makes sense and, uh, and what is expected by the, uh, by the writer. So the part of the code that is operating on a shared resource, we call it, this, this is a critical section. And we want to make sure that the critical section is only executed by one process and no more. This is basically the outline of the problem that we have. Protecting critical sections. And that's some examples from the, uh, from the code. I would like to thank you. Uh, I would like you to think for a while. I'm going to show you a, a, a short snippets of the code, and I wanted to thank you if it is good or bad. So, example number one: we have a shared integer, and we're having two go routines, and both of them are using the shared integer and are just adding one to it. Is it in this in this way? If we program it this way, is it good or bad? Well, you might guess this is bad. This is bad because we are using a single variable. We are writing uh, to both coroutines are writing to it possibly at the same time. We cannot do that without additional code adding some synchronization. Example two, the same. We have a shared integer. And in this case, we are reading from it. Uh, and using some calculations, right? So the, the i is s plus one, and the other go routine is, 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 is doing some other calculation based on this variable. Is it good or is it bad? This one is good because we are not writing it, we're not amending it, we're just reading from, uh, from, the, from, from the variable, and this is allowed uh, without, without synchronization. Example number three, more interesting. We have a shared slice, like array of 10 integers. And the first go routine is in incrementing like the, the first element of the, um, of the array. And the second go routine is um, in incrementing the second element of the, uh, of the array. Now, is it good or is it bad? Just bad. Bad? Who said bad? I don't know. I can't see it. <laughs> I said. Uh, this one is actually good. So this is tricky a little bit. And I actually quite often have a question, even from experienced programmers saying, is it good or is it bad? Can I do that? You can do that because this is basically like having two different variables. They're, they're basically, the, the integers, the first integer and the second integer are in distinct memory blocks. And you're just reading from it. You're, mod you're not modifying the array itself. You're just modifying the, the elements which are placed within the array. But this is just this is just fine. Um, if you are, I know, appending to the array or changing like the, this common part of the array, this would be bad. But in this case, in this case, this is this is fine. Basically, you can also just having two separate variables, and this would be the same. Example four, going more interesting, we are having a map. We're having a map, uh, this is the weight of the animals. We keep the, the animal and, 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 the, and the average weight of the animal. I checked on Wikipedia, actually that. So the gopher is around 200 grams and the python is around uh, 12 kilograms. That's why maybe the Golang is more lightweight than python. I don't know, but possibly. Um, so the question is, we have a map. And then we are just having two go routines. One is writing um, the um, um, weight of gopher, and the second one is uh, writing the um, weight of Python. Is it good or is it bad? So this one is actually um, this one is actually bad because we are modifying the map itself. So we don't have a go through, we don't have a Python there. We're actually writing to the, to the, to the map and the map needs to be modified here um, by the common code. So 
basically we need to maybe allocate the buckets in the map we need, basically internally we need to change uh, how the how the map is laid so you cannot do that without synchronization and example five is we have a map as well the same kind of map we had before uh, but we created here so we already have like a gopher and python and then we have a two go routines reading from this map the, the weight of uh, gopher and the weight of python now is this good or is it bad good this one is good because the map is created it's already there you are not changing anything within the map structure itself. You can read from it. Okay, so the basic basic examples. Um, you definitely, in order to figure out whether whether you can do some things without synchronization or not on the low level structure like this, you need you need some experience and basically some knowledge how how the structure maybe are are. are and not very deep uh, knowledge, but you basically need to know what the array is, what the map is, and to be able to figure out if something is modifying some uh, some, some 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 maybe common uh, common area of memory or not. At least I think it's helpful. So what 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 the solutions we have to solve the examples uh, we had before? We have a few approach approach. So the first approach will be just use the local variables in routines so do not share basically the data and you can basically create variables in the go routines and you can pass it basically using for example uh, channels right so in this way you're not sharing things you're just passing over the the, uh, the, the transfer the, the ownership and uh, things are, are going to be safe the other approach would be just use immutable objects this is something we had Kind of before when we just create an object and only read from it, and this way, if you just do not mutate things, this is also going to be um, to be safe. And the two other examples we are going to focus more in this talk is the mutual uh, mutual exclusion, which is mutexes, when we actually want to serialize the access to the critical section, and also the atomic operations. And the atomic operations are operations provided by cpu actually to the machine machine code you can call the machine um, my, my machine instruction to actually operate on some parts of the data in an atomic way on the cpu level but you're only really limited to a very small parts of data basically up to a word size which is like eight bytes on, on common actual infrastructure Okay, so take a little bit of examples. So local variables are basically good for this example is basically counting, counting like let's say words uh, in the in the in the, uh, in the document, right? So you could basically have like a counter, which is a map of words, uh, the channel with the results. You can create one go routine when you just count things, and then you pass the result to the uh, to the channel. The same here. And then, so you have basically like local local variables here that are not shared among go routines. And then you pass pass it to the uh, to the um, uh, to the channel, which is read in yet another go routine where you are merging those those counters into the total counter. This is a very nice approach. It works very well because each go routine has the only local variables. You don't need any synchronization. They are independent, just doing their stuff uh, without going and blocking or anything. And once they are done, you're just merging in, in, in one place. Very good approach, but not always very practical. Many people will tell you, and I, I mean, maybe not many people tell you, but I met some people uh, starting with Golang saying, oh, we don't need to use mutexes and all those things. We can do everything using channels. To some extent, yes, but really sometimes it's much easier to use and better to use like mutex rather than doing everything, trying to solve everything using using channels. So immutable objects are basically the example we had number uh, the, the number five, where we had like a 
pre pre created map uh, with some basically static. It's like using the constants, right? Uh, you have a pre, uh, pre created map, and then you can freely use it in any Go routine, just accessing it and use it. Not a problem. However, my comment here is that it might be a good idea maybe to like high wrap the map with some structure and only expose like the get method so you're not accidentally writing to it. But it's up to you. And now mutual exclusion are basically mutexes. And you can use mutexes to implement the critical section. So here we have a shared variable s in the integer. We can increment this integer safely using the lock. So basically, we have a lock as a mutex. We acquire the lock, do it, or executing critical section, and then unlocking. You really need to remember about unlocking. I mean, if you forget to unlock things, you're just going to have a deadlock. I mean, deadlock basically, the people that go routines waiting to acquire the lock, but it's not, never going to be freed because you just forgot to unlock it. And it usually happens when, for example, you add like a return section here on some error and you forget to call unlock. It actually happened to me like many times. So that's why usually in the code, you will see this kind of, um, um, of the structure where you call defer unlock to make sure that whatever happens, whatever happens in this function, you are going to call, call unlock. And then now atomic operations. Atomic operations are very interesting. I mean, interesting. I mean, they are interesting because they are like a base layer for implementing mutexes and other synchronization methods. Uh, not always you will need them, usually not. Sometimes they're useful. I will show you later why they could be useful. So basically, the example before, instead of using mutex, we can use atomic operation. I had to check the type from int to int64 because the int is platform specific. It could be 32 bits or 64 bits. And atomic operations, must, we must specify what kind of a, a, the, 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 the variable size you have. So you can operate like on integer 64. Basically, you can add 1 to s atomic. And the same here, and this is safe. This is safe, and this is also much more lightweight than using mutexes because it's happening on the CPU level and you don't need to synchronize things uh, on the upper level. And then you can get the total at any point uh, during this routines being executed by using the load in 64. Now, one more example with atomic operations is that they're only really useful in operating on a small bit of data. You, you shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, expect that if you have more integers, you can just like implement the whole critical sections using like a series of atomic operations. Because let's take a look at this example. We, have, we are adding one to s, and this at int is returning as the value after adding the value. Here we are doing the same, but we are also loading the value from s into another variable. So normally you would think like that v2 and r2 should be the same because you're just adding one here and then you're loading the value of s, so they should be the same. But they don't necessarily need to be the same because the way how this could be executed on the CPU level on the memory level, like, like, like a timeline level, is that we could, this could like the V2 should happen, could happen first. So we, are, we would add one to S and the S would have a value of one. And then we could execute this. And then at the end, this. So we could end up having V2 having one and R2 having two. This is possible. That's why if these two operations are related. You cannot really implement critical section by a series of atomic operations. You have to acquire the lock and make sure that the whole series is executed as, a, as one atomic operation. OK, so let's go to package sync. 
the package thing we're going to so it's not it's not a very big package it's it's here just this and i'm going to just go through all the things we have there and tell you what they are for so we will start with mutexes this is something that you're going to use probably mostly from the well maybe not but the, one of two things that are more, more more useful thing in the in the sync package. So the sync uh, the, the, the mutex is the mutual exclusion lock. It implements only two methods: lock and unlock. Um, it allows you to implement the critical section with only one executor at a given time. But you have to be careful because it can cause deadlocks if you don't you know, if you are not careful. The deadlock is basically in Golang if you acquire the lock and forget to unlock it, and like basically all Go routines stopped and there's nothing happening. The Golang is kind enough to tell you there is a deadlock, like nothing is happening. I'm just waiting. All Go routines are waiting on something, but because there's no Go routine running, nothing, nothing can really can unlock things. So nothing will happen ever. Error, panic, end of execution you, you i guess you have always seen it if you haven't seen it yet you will see it for sure along with the mutex this rw mutex is basically like a read writer mutual exclusion lock so this is like basically like a two logs inside of one log uh, like like, a, like one uh, one structure and it allows you to remember when we're talking about the readers and the reading is fine from from the structure and multiple we can basically have multiple go routines reading from one structure but there's only one writer allowed to do things so this is basically where the read writer uh, mutexes are helpful allowing you to have multiple readers but only one writer so basically we have a R log and R unlock, which is a reader. This is the reader part. When you are reading, you are acquiring and locking this one. And for writers, you have a lock and unlock. And if, if there's a writer who wants to lock the mutex, the, the mutex will wait for all the readers to finish their work, not allowing the new readers, all the readers to finish. Then the writer will come in, the critical section, only one writer, do things, and on the exit will allow all the readers. And this is very useful, for example, if you have like a, let's say, a const, pretty much constant, like a you know, map with some predefined values, but sometimes you want to reload it, like every five minutes, you know, maybe from the server. So usually it's safe to use by multiple Go routines. But from time to time, you want to actually stop the world, like the garbage collector, stop the world, refresh the refresh the, the variable, and then allow the readers again. Then there is a sync once. The sync once is a simple structure. There's no variables, uh, like a public variables in the structure. There's only one method, which is do, where you can pass the function. And this variable makes sure that when you call the do multiple times with the function, this function will be called only once. And this is very useful for lazy initialization when uh, lazy, lazy initialization is basically instead of like creating like the, the, a, a, a function new and like a constructor for the object and you create everything, you initiate the object on the very first use of it. But because I don't know, maybe the object will be never used, and you don't want to spend the time or uh, for the initialization. Uh, that's that's where the the, um, the sync once is useful. You could implement it using the mutex and the some boolean flag saying has it been already initially initialized or not. But not only once will be easier to use and uh, more readable. And it also will be faster because you can actually take a look in the implementation. This is cool about Golang. You just go in the documentation, take a look at once, click on the do, and basically see how it's implemented. Very, very simple implementation. I'm not going to go into details, but basically, if something has been already initialized, we are just using the 
atomic uh, operation on the dawn flag to see if it was dawn. So once something is initialized, you just have a really small penalty of checking it by loading a, a one variable atomically from the, from the memory. So if you're using lazy initialization, use, please use sync once. Then we have a sync weight group. And the weight group is actually very useful. This is the, the, the most probably useful thing here, the weight group and the mutex. And the weight group, uh, the weight group allows you to spawn, I think it spawn a lot of go routines and to wait for them to be, uh, to finish all of them. It's not really bound to go routines, to go routines. There's no go routine anywhere in the weight group and you can actually use it as a more general counter waiter, but it was designed specifically for solving the problems of uh, waiting on, on multiple go routines to finish. So you have three methods, add, when before spawning the go routine, you call add to the wait group, then every go routine is responsible for calling it down. And in another go routine, you can just wait for all the go routines uh, to finish. And the weight, the weight basically blocks until the equal number of adds and don'ts have been called. Final, sync pool. Sync pool is, it's useful. I've been using it multiple times and it's especially also useful with the uh, previous talk about the output collector. It's basically the sync pool allows you to store the temporary objects um, on the pool. Uh, the basically, this is relieving the pressure for garbage collector when the objects are on the pool and they're not, they not collected back by the garbage collector, but they could be. So it's not, it's not the same as keeping some temporary object on the array because the garbage collector actually has some insight into sync pool. And if you have too many of them, garbage collector is allowed to actually take part of the pool and reclaim the, reclaim the memory. The example of the, the usage of the sync pool is, for example, in the package format, like the print, um, where, more maybe like printf actually, where you are passing like the format and the values, and then the format package needs to create the actual, the actual value, like the actual string out of, out of few format and the values. And Internally, it's using like a buffers to create those. You don't see them, but they are internally. And what the, for, uh, what the package is doing is just basically uh, allocating these buffers and putting back on the pool and taking them from the pool and reusing them. And they are not going to the garbage collector every time, every time you print something. And then we have sync map. Uh, map which is basically like a generic map, which is thread safe, like an interface interface map. It's safe for concurrent use, and, but it's a very specialized type with very specific use cases. And before you actually start using SIG map, you should see the docs, read the docs, and see what the use cases are. There are two of them. And I have like many, and then actually the documentation says that Usually, it's better to use like a regular map of the mutex. Because I had, again, I, I, when, the, when the sync map appeared, many people were saying like, well, great, now we have a sync map and we don't need to use mutexes because we can just jump into the sync map and, and be thread safe. But please don't do it. I mean, it's usually it's better just to use a map and the, and the mutex unless you're within the two use cases uh, of the sync map, which are uh, in the docs. I'm not going to tell you about the, the, the use cases because I actually want you to go to the docs and read them to make sure that, 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 that you believe me that there are very useful information in the documentation. And then there is a condition variable. This is more complex, a little bit more advanced. The condition variable is it's kind of wrapping a lock, like a mutex, and it's, it's like a rendezvous point for go routines which are waiting for some event, and the go routines which are, which are announcing some event. Uh, basically, you don't want to create like a mutex, uh, or maybe like a, like, a, like a constant loop waiting for some event uh, with the mutex, and like a sleep one second. 
you would, you would be able to like being like woken up if something happened and that what the one the one goal routine is able to wake up the other goal routine this is where you can use condition variable uh, it has a good wait method when one one or multiple goal routines can wait for the event then you have a signal when you can wake up one of the goal routines like one of the mutexes or you can broadcast when you could like wake up everyone uh, but in it's, as I said, it's complex and it usually in simple cases, you can use channels to do that because channels are blocking and you can wait on channels for something to happen. And you can announce that something would happen by sending this on the channel. And a great example is, for example, like a time ticker. And this is something like you have a ticker, basically sending an event every, say, minute or whatever you set it up. So it's good to know it's something like that in the library. I use it like maybe two or three times in quite low level code uh, but usually you're not going to really need this but be very careful about reading documentations about this as well because it's very easy to use it uh, use it better so this is basically the end of the of the sync package now we have a sync atomic which is like a sub sub package of of the package sync and uh, as i said before uh, you can operate on, 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 on integers or pointers uh, and you can use the multiple, the multiple functions here. Atomic, there are multiple functions. They're usually the same, just operating on the, just operating on the different, different times like add uh, int 32, 64, uh, unsigned in blah blah blah, uh, but basically they uh, they are for either storing the vari the, the variables atom the values atomically, loading them from memory atomically, adding to them. We've seen in the example swapping the values atomically and compare and swap, which is very useful as well, uh, where you can basically just swap the value only if it's equal to something predefined. This is this is useful for uh, for some low level things as well for implementing basically for implementing something similar to sync once where you want to make sure that you only want to execute uh, execute the code uh, code once. But if we go back to the sync sync package and to the once do the implementation. In the comments, actually, you have the example of here is an incorrect implementation of do, and here is the atomic compare and swap. <laughs> uh, and it tells you why this is an incorrect implementation. So I really encourage you to actually even go deeper than documentations and go into the code because they're very interesting things uh, in the code. Just don't read it now. You will have time at home. Okay, so basically, basically this is this is it. What we have, uh, what we have uh, in the uh, in the sync package, we covered we covered it all. And now I would like to show you some example how to use it in uh, in practice. Uh, can you see my code? Yes. Cool, cool. Uh, let me just figure out how to do this. Okay. So I have already created like a simple application. Uh, this application is, uh, is not thread safe. There's a simple application. And the, the, what, what the application is going to do is we are going to uh, res, uh, just query DNS, DNS domain name servers, and just going to resolve the IP addresses for some of the domains. So I just got like a, some domains, like a top domains, like 14 of them, and I created like example of how we are going to maybe use new texts and when we want to use a single structure and synchronize among caching dns queries is very common and even your router or all the servers are going to use it 
So what we have here, we have a resolver. This is a structure. The resolver is going to be use some custom address or the default one, which is a Google Google uh, Google DNS resolver. Uh, this is our actual resolver we are going to use from the net resolver, um, from the from the net package, and it's already thread safe. This one. We are going to the cache, which basically we are going to store uh, the responses for the query. And cache hits is like a statistic number telling us how many times we actually got the value from the from the cache. Uh, instead of actually doing the, uh, like, a, like a network query. So then we have an init method in the resolver. Uh, the init method basically is like, a, like, a, um, like a constructor. It should be probably like a new, but I want to show you how to use some of the, some of the sync uh, methods. So the init is the uh, initiate the resolver. It creates a new cache. Uh, it gets the address, either the one from the resolver or the default one. And then it creates the resolver from the from the net package. Here we say that we want to use Go instead of like um, uh, from the operating system. Uh, and here we create the dial the, the other with the, the with the proper address. You don't need to actually understand this part. It's just showing you that we are just creating creating the structure. Now this is the only like the main function of our resolver because like a lookup host and. What it does, it takes the host, so like, like Google.com, Microsoft.com, and returns returns the list of addresses because this is what DNS does. It returns you the, the array of IP addresses, not only one, but many of them. Uh, so what we do now, uh, we basically check if the resolver is nil. If it's nil, we know, oh, it's not initialized yet. So let's initialize, uh, initialize it. Uh, then we will check cache first. Basically, we check in the cache if the host was already queried and we had something in there. Uh, we just increment the cache hit saying, okay, we, we got it from the cache and we return here. Uh, otherwise, if we don't have it in the cache, we'll do a proper network query using the resolver lookup host. And then we will save the value in the, in the cache host address and return the address. I think this is this is a simple thing. We're just wrapping, we're just wrapping lookup host basically with, with the caching player. The check hash itself is very simple. It basically just it basically just check the uh, check the cache and uh, and return the address. Okay. Uh, the cache hits is the method which will just return the integer saying how many how many cache hits we have. All right, I think this is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is quite simple. So now we have a main function, main function that we are going to use it. As an example, um, we have an output. I just, I, just, I, just, I just pipe everything to STD, uh, STD out from the logger because it's easier for me to, uh, to use the standard output that's standard error um, in the command line. Uh, we are creating resolver. In the case, I'm just using the quad one uh, DNS. Doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm going to create like a lookups in um, the variable, which is going to uh, we are going to count how many uh, how many lookups we, we made. Uh, and then I'm just calling in the loop hundreds of times. I just choose one domain, random domain from the domains we had before. I make the lookup host. Look up the host into our resolver. Increment the lookups. And that's it. And then I print some stats. The idea is basically here to like imitate some Go routines, some process. And if you open the browser, go to the website, you just have like a multiple DNS queries, possibly for the same domain many times. So I just want to like you know uh, simulate something like that. So we have multiple multiple queries for the same domains uh, for the same domain. So I'm going to run this code. Cool. So. This is not, this one is not very super interesting, basically like a DNS, like Wikipedia org. Uh, we got like one, uh, one response for uh, IP version four, one response for IP version six, and so on for all the domains we had. This is not, we're not going to focus on that. But at the end, 
we can see that we queried everything, 100 lookups in uh, less than one second, uh, 86, responses, uh, 86 uh, responses were cached. Obviously, obviously, if I if I remove the part of the, the, the of cache and run the same, so I just disable the cache, this is going to take much much longer. Uh, it hangs for a bit because I'm just waiting for the for the network. Okay, so I made like 100 lookups now. Nothing was cached. It took me almost 10 seconds. But everyone knows cache is very useful, right? <laughs> Especially for that. Okay. Uh, what I want to do now is basically to be able to use our resolver by multiple go routines at the same time. So not only I have like a one single routine doing the DNS queries, but I have multiple go routines doing DNS queries and I want to achieve the same. I want to be able to use our cached values. Okay, so I just, let's do whatever. The, the first thing that I, I think will be sensible, I will just run, I will just run like 10, uh, 10 go routines. Right, go bank, um, it's very stressful doing it, live coding. Uh, so I'm calling basically 10 Go routines doing, doing the, same, the same thing. Uh, the first problem we have here now is what's going to happen if I run this code? It's like, like nothing will happen. <laughs> I ended up basically return after 80 nanoseconds and doing no DNS queries whatsoever. And the reason is basically that I just spawn 10 Go routines and then just exit the code, right? So this is not something that I want to do. I want to actually to run the Go routines and wait for them to finish. So if you remember from the, from the, uh, from the slides, we can use a wait group, sync wait group. You are going to, before creating every Go routine, you are going to add one saying, oh, I'm adding, adding one Go routine. Now we want to every Go routine to call done. Uh, once the Go routine is done. And then I want to here, just before printing the stats, I want to wait for the Go routines. This is what I want. Okay, uh, what will happen now? Oh shit, <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's definitely not, I mean, something happened. I mean, we panicked and I'm going to tell you why. We have panicked because the code is not thread safe. So we just use not thread safe structure by multiple Go routines. Uh, I'm not sure if there is the, the output will be any meaningful. Actually the maps, actually maps have some real time check to make sure that you are not writing to them concurrently by multiple Go routines. And this is what we see here. So the map actually detected the problem, like, oh shit, you're not thread safe. And it told us, so we basically know what's, what's happening. There is actually another approach we can do is that the build, the, build, the, the, the compiler of Golang has a flag race, the race, is for race condition. And the race condition is basically what we see on the image in my slides when multiple, multiple um, Go routines are writing to a single, uh, single memory block. So we can actually use the race when running it. And it's going to be much slower to run it because the, 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 the binary will only use one thread uh, to run it and see what's happening. But it's actually going to tell us so even if we hadn't we had we haven't had panic, it would tell us there's a data race and it would tell us exactly where it is in the code. Like, oh, this is this one routine was writing here, and the other routine was writing here. This is probably something that you should look at. And remember that the, the test, go test, has also this race flag. And I encourage you in your like a CI or whatever to always run 
tests with the race flag, or maybe both without the race flag to be like more fast and then doing things and maybe with. But yeah, I usually just run with the race flag. And uh, it allows you basically to, uh, to detect the problem uh, early because you are not going to have panics of, uh, every time. And believe me, believe me that the panic is a good thing. The worst thing that could happen is you run the not threat safe code uh, wrongly and it's, there's no panic. And basically just doing like random things in your memory and you're having like a weird, weird uh, uh, the values at the end and you cannot detect them. Okay, so we know that we have multiple rights to the uh, to the map. We know where the problem is. Basically, this is our cache map. So we need to make the cache thread safe. We are going to add the lock to the resolver. So let's call it a lock. The lock will be like the mutex. And the easiest way would be just, okay, I want to make the lookup host to be thread safe. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lock here. And at the end of the function, I want to unlock. Now let's run this. Uh, maybe without the race flag, because we have more problem than this. Oh, let's run this. Okay, we have no panic. We have no panic. Uh, we finish it in the in the 600 milliseconds. So seems to work. Seems to work. I'm just going to show you that with the race flag, we still have the problems. We still have the we still have the problems. Uh, I can't see them now, but uh, okay. So I can just move. We still have the problems. So we still have the data races, but no panic this time. We'll take a look at it later. So, so this is one approach. We can just make the massive flock here. But what's the problem with acquiring acquiring log here and unlocking here? Is that basically the whole lookup host is now the critical section, and only one Go routine can perform a DNS query. And DNS query takes a long time. I mean, like maybe one second, maybe half a second, maybe 100 milliseconds, but it, it's basically not like immediate. And I already told you that the, 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 the net resolver is thread safe. We can use them use it for multiple Go routines. So we definitely don't want this part of the code to be within our critical section. Only, only the cache should be within the critical section. That's why what we do is not here, but we will protect our check cache. And we'll also need to add log here. So basically, anytime we use cache, we need to be this within our critical section. It's useful maybe to provide some documentation as well, like if log is, um, is protecting uh, protecting uh, cache map. Sometimes people are also like grouping the things like log and, and, and maybe the variables you want to protect uh, within like a single block of variables. So now if we run it, oh, now we run the same thing. And you can see before we had like, we had like a 600 milliseconds, and now we, we have like less than 200 milliseconds, the whole thing, because we allowed for the slow thing to be not within the critical section, and multiple DNS queries were run at the same time, and the slowest one probably took like 181 milliseconds. So this is cool. This seems to work. But as I said before, we still have data races. Uh, we can actually take a look at it, where the data races are. Maybe some of you will know, uh, like 120, uh, the line 122. Uh, no, this is from the stack. So 128, um, 74, sorry. So basically, oh, it says that the cache hits were accessed, that there's a data race in this line. Is it correct? Is it correct? Because this is not part of the critical section and multiple Go routines are actually where amending these cache hits. There are two options here. You can either move this part into maybe the check cache within the critical section. And then also when getting the cache hits, you can implement the critical section here as well, like this part of code move here. It 
would be, it, it, it will be fine, it will be fine. Uh, but remember when I showed you the atomic operations, so this is something this is useful for basically creating some statistics where you just want to increment or add some information to a single integer. So what we could do here is basically we could use atomic, uh, atomic adds in 64, take the address, add one. And here we have atomic loads in 64 and we'll use this one. And this should solve at least our problem with this race condition. So we still, we still have the race condition, but hopefully not this in this place. Now it tells us we have like in 132. Yeah, this is something else. So now it tells us uh, that there's a race condition in lookups. Yeah, this is correct because we also started to use lookups in not thread safe manner. We have basically just need to do the same thing here. Atomic at in 64 lookups one. And now that it will be fine. We can we can uh, we can use it here. We can use it here. We still have something wrong. 51. Okay. We still have something wrong. Uh, the problem is with the initialization. So we allowed multiple go routines to use the, the, the to use the lookup host, but we didn't take care of the initialization. So multiple go routine actually can call the initialization. We don't want to do that. So remember, I was telling you about this sync once. Uh, we can we can use it here. Let's call it once. So like we could just call it init or init once. Uh, what we are going to do is basically uh, do air once do r it. Oh. And this part of code is, is guaranteed to be called, the init is granted only called once by the first, first caller. If there are two callers which basically go into this function at the same time, the other one, the second one will just wait for initialization to finish. This is also the important part of the of the of the ones do. Cool. Uh, the code, there's no race condition. Just, just be careful. If the compilers tell you there's no race condition, it doesn't mean there's no race conditions. I mean, this is just like you know, optimistic. It just tries to detect them, but it cannot detect everything. And definitely don't try to do this thing that I've done now, just to just write the code. You compile it using the uh, using the, the racer uh, that they, they built with race flag and trying to solve the problems because basically you should you know, start from the beginning uh, designing this resolver in the proper way. But anyway, we have fixed this, this problems and now we can use the resolver in the safe manner. Uh, there's one one thing that I want to show you uh, well, do I have it here no so basically we have we created this um, atomic uh, atomic uh, we use the atomic in the cache hits um, so what the loss us for example we could create like a separate now function uh, the go routine which basically would print some stats for us. Uh, which like format print uh, print f and I could basically don't I just just I can just do this. Let's like start the stats here. Yeah. Uh, okay, time slip, time millisecond, time millisecond. Uh, so what I want to, what I want to show you is, uh, Uh, 
that basically you can you can create like a function that is basically like reading reading the statistics from the from the current object from time to time in the safe manner using uh, using the atomic operations. So you don't really you don't really need to acquire the log and stop the whole lookup host uh, mechanism, and you don't need to basically the punish the production code with the logs. But you can just take the the, the atomic counters and just I don't know, print them or send them maybe to your, to some uh, to some external external logger and and be able to, to you know, see what's um, what's happening. Yeah, that's it. So we created basically from the non-thread state resolver. We created a thread safe resolver, uh, which is uh, be able to use by the multiple go routines using uh, uh, a few of the concepts we have in the. Uh, in the um, uh, package sync, and so yeah, thank you, and Q&A.